Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. A Fascinate Productions podcast for drug science. So welcome everyone to the Drug Science Podcast. I'm joined by the host of Say Why to Drugs, the podcast in the University of Liverpool by the lecturer Susie Gage. Welcome to London. Thank you very much. Singer, songwriter and medical cannabis advocate, fresh off her total world tour, Joss Stone. Thanks for joining us, Joss. Thank you for having me. And to complete the panel, a woman who's been on the front line of the fight for medical cannabis in order to treat her son, Alfie. It's a pleasure to be joined by Hannah Deacon. Hi, David. Thanks for having me. Today, we're discussing the topic of medical cannabis. But first, here are a few clips to put this into context. I have multiple sclerosis. I have a lot of pain, I have a lot of spasms. I have bladder weakness, I have trouble walking distances, appetite, problems sleeping, and cannabis helps with all of those different things. Clark French is the founder of the United Patients Alliance, a medical cannabis support group here in the UK. The problem with the drugs that are available in NHS, for pain especially, they're mainly opiate based. There were over 23 million opioid prescriptions during 2018, a number which has been rapidly rising for more than a decade. Clark thinks there's another way. GW Pharmaceuticals are making Sativex. Even though my doctor, my MS nurse and my neurologist all think that I should have Sativex, the NHS can't pay for it, so I have to break the law every single day just to be well. MS sufferers aren't the only ones who can benefit from cannabis-based medication. My neighbour complained frequently about being able to hear me screaming through the walls. Carly Barton suffered a stroke in 2010, which led her to develop the neurological condition, fibromyalgia. After six years of taking ever-increasing amounts of the opioids morphine and fentanyl, she decided to take a different approach. When I was taking fentanyl, morphine and diazepam, I would still be in a sort of 8 out of 10 pain. Cannabis has got the ability to bring down my pain from a 10 to like a 2 in the space of 5 to 10 minutes. But despite being given one of the first prescriptions for medical cannabis in the UK, Carly has found getting the medicine she needs far more difficult than you might think. I have tried to get this through in a legal way. I had a legal NHS prescription. I'm about to run out. I'm going to have to call a dealer to the house. I don't want to be a criminal. I literally just want to have my medicine so that I can live my life. Carly isn't the only one to be put in this situation. Back to Clark. My mum, she also has MS. She isn't a cannabis consumer because she's she's not comfortable with breaking the law. I will put my health above it and I will say, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to break the law because I want that quality of life. We need clear guidelines which say cannabis is medicine and people that consume it should not be criminalised for that. So let's, uh, let's start with Hannah because you have been pioneering access of medical cannabis to the UK. For how long is that? Um, we started our Alfie's Hope campaign in January 2017 and Alfie received the first permanent cannabis licence. Well, his doctors received the licence to prescribe for Alfie on the 19th of June 2018 a day that I will never forget. <laughs> so tell us about Alfie's story. Um, Alfie has a very rare epilepsy called PCDH19. There's only nine boys in the world with it. It's a non-inherited genetic condition as well, so Dad and I don't have it, so it just happened. The first seizure he had was when he was eight months old. I found him in his bed having a huge tonic-clonic seizure. He was boiling hot. I waited for it to stop. I put him in the car and I drove him to my local hospital and... We were absolutely terrified. I've never seen a seizure before in my life. It's never been in my family. Um, we got to our local hospital and we were told, oh, it's probably just a febrile convulsion, which can happen when you have a high temperature. Um, but it was quickly very obvious that Alfie was very seriously ill and he had lots and lots of seizures. In the end, we were transferred to Stoke Hospital where we were there for two weeks and they couldn't help us. And I insisted that we went to a specialist unit where we ended up at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And after three and a half weeks of him being on an 
a life support machine, he was treated with intravenous steroids and his, his seizures stopped and he was diagnosed at that point with immune responsive epilepsy. So he is only responsive to steroids, nothing else works. And we've tried the ketogenic diet, we've tried um, immunoglobulins, we've tried nearly 15 anti-epileptics and all anti-epileptics do for him is make him either extremely aggressive or cause him to have seizures. So he has a very, very difficult condition. And as he got older, his seizures just got worse. And by age five, he was having a severe chronic cluster of seizures every week. So we were in hospital actually to put it into context 48 times before we went to Holland um, in one year which is pretty much every week. So we were going to hospital two o'clock in the morning in an ambulance emergency, trying to get steroids into him. It was very traumatic for me and my partner and my family. You know, it was awful. And the doctors were saying, if the seizures don't kill him, the steroids will. So then when did you think of cannabis? Well, at that point, he was having up to 25 doses of intravenous methylprednisolone a month, which no one can tolerate. And I just felt absolutely desperate and I was watching my child die in front of my eyes basically and I just thought right okay well I can either accept this and I can listen to the doctors completely and accept that they're gods and that they get everything right or I can start questioning it and that's what I did I just sort of thought well you know what do steroids do they suppress your immune response so okay this is an immune response maybe this is what Great Ormond Street said so let's go online and look at epilepsy treatments and I just found medical cannabis kept coming up as a, a very good treatment for epilepsy. I talked to families in America and Canada and decided to do some research. I watched, I remember watching a very good film with you on yeah. YouTube about the endocannabinoid system. So I learned that and I just thought I need to learn, I need to understand what I'm talking about. I learned the difference between hemp and, you know, cannabis sativa and indica and what it does and all that sort of stuff. And I, went to my doctor in March 2017 and said, what about cannabis? And he actually said to me at that point, if you talk to me again about cannabis, I'm going to speak to social services about you. <laughs> what, to take your child away? Yeah. So absurd. I moved yeah. my doctor <laughs> because I thought, well, you know, he's going to die. And I... Drew and I have always said, you know, if we do ever lose our child, we need to know that we have done Absolutely. everything in our power to keep him alive because then I might not have to live with so much guilt, you know, and that's what has always driven me is to know that I've done the right thing for my child. So we moved to hospital. We met a wonderful doctor who had us in for a month and tried to do everything he could to stop using steroids and we couldn't. And I said to him, what about medical cannabis? We've spoken to our GP, our paediatrician. We even had the support of our MP at that point. And he said, his words were to me, you have no choice, go for it. And I thought, well, thank God we found one doctor that actually is doing, doing the right thing by my child. And going for it was going to Holland. Yeah. So in September 2017, we went to The Hague and we lived there for five months. And my mission was to collect as much data as possible to show that my son responded to cannabis. And the first five weeks, he didn't respond at all. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, we're going to have to go home and watch him die. And then... As I was thinking that, he went 17 days and he without a seizure. And then every month that went by, he got better and better and better. And we added in a very small amount of extra THC and he went 41 days. And when he did have seizures, he had two or three. So then in February 2018, we decided to come home and fight our battle in the UK. And that's when we met Peter Carroll from End Our Pain, who said that he would help us with strategy. I mean, I, I've never done a campaign in my life. I've never been on TV. I've never done anything like this. So he got me on TV and got the right MPs behind us and everything. And in March 2000, the beginning of March 2018, the government put out, a, a after an interview I'd done on BBC Breakfast, saying that there was no medicinal value to cannabis and that they would not allow Alfie to be prescribed Betrolite or Bedica. And I also met a very eminent paediatrician, neurologist, who said to me, you will never get a THC prescription on the NHS. So for me, I thought, right, OK, come on, bring it on. Right, I'm right gonna, it. I, yeah, yeah right, absolutely. Right. I thought, I'll prove you wrong. Um, so in March 2018, I met the Prime Minister with my petition and she allowed our doctors to apply for a licence, which has never happened in the UK before. It's only ever been pharmaceutical companies. Was Alfie still in No, Holland we then? were in England then. So we took Alfie off the THCs, which made him very, very poorly. So 
We did three and a half months. Professor Mike Barnes led our group, amazing man who helped get our license, did a lot of work completely for free, um, months and months of work with the Home Office. And then on the 18th of June, um, after we'd agreed with the Home Office that we'd met everything that we needed to do, I had the Chief of Staff phone me on the 18th of June and say, oh, there's just one more thing and I just lost my rag. And that's what I'm like. I'm very calm and very patient until, until at some point someone really pushed it. And I just thought, I've had three months of watching my son suffer. I'm, I'm done. And that was the, de- the next day, the 19th of June, I went on the Today programme with John Humphreys and I said, Theresa May looked me in the eye and she promised me she would help me. And I feel like I've been played. And I'm a mother of a very sick child and you don't play the parents of sick children. And within three hours we had the licence. So <laughs> I had to play a little bit dirty in the end. But, you know, I felt that I'd done everything. Do you think it's incompetence in government or resistance? or it's a bit fear. Of both? Fear. It's fear of the media? I think it's fear of cannabis. <laughs> Now, I had a lot of conversations with Nick Hurd, the Minister for Fire and Policing, who was dealing with it. I remember him saying to me, you know, we find this really difficult because it's out of our comfort zone. And that's the thing. I think they were just completely out of their comfort zone. These are people that have been told from the beginning of time, probably, that cannabis is dangerous and bad and it causes psychosis. And you're asking people to provide a prescription of that for a little boy who's got epilepsy. And I think, again, still the huge problem we see in the government now is stigma and fear. Yes, it's different. I mean, you're lying about something for 50 years it, mm. it, it, to completely People change tack. People start believing it, don't they? Well, they do. <laughs> they want to believe yeah. it because they, they end up being a prejudice. Mm. Yeah. Well, Hannah, I've listened to you a number of times and what you'll be pleased to know that after the talking to you last week, I've started to write a paper on why the medical profession is just so backward on cannabis. Mm. Wow, well, that's a tough story. I mean, you, you've had a bit of tr- trouble, Joss, over the years with uh, being a proponent and a supporter of a, a rational view of cannabis. Do you want to share that with us? Yeah, well, you know, when you support things like this, people just say, don't be so silly, you little hippie. That's usually <laughs> what, what you get. Um, it's difficult because people don't, they don't really want to hear it. Mm. And no matter how much you put in front of them, no matter how many testimonies like yours, they just don't want to hear it. And then when you go and speak to doctors and vets, for me, it, it was my dog that I, oh, right. I dealt with. Tell us about that. Then. So, um, okay, so Dusty. First, there was Missy. Missy was my Rottweiler, and I was using the oil with her. She didn't have cancer. She was just very poorly. And I'd been kind of interested in this for years previously, but I didn't know enough. So I was giving it to her because she wasn't eating. And then she did start eating. And then I went to my vet and I said, oh, I'm giving her this oil that I made in my kitchen. And of course, I don't know whether it's got this much THC and this much CBD. I have no idea. I just get the plant and I just make the oil and I give it to her. And she was getting better and better. And I said to my vet, this is what I'm doing. And he he was like, you can't do that. Don't do that. I don't know what what's going to happen with the other drugs we're giving her. So it, it made me nervous and I stopped and then she died. Um, It just went worse the second that I stopped. So when Dusty, my tiny little teacup poodle, she got sick and I took her to the vets and they said that she had a tumour in her bladder. She was kind of stopping to pee every two seconds. And I thought, this isn't right. She's so tiny. You know, this is, it's going wrong. And they said, yeah, that there's a tumour there, but we can do chemotherapy and radiotherapy for this tiny little dog. I mean, she's half the size of a cat. She's 14. No, that will definitely kill her. They're like, well, that's what you have to do. And I said, no, no, I think I'll just give her some cannabis oil and see how it goes because she's old and it could go well or not. Two months later, just two months, I took her back. They scanned her, different vets, because I kind of fell out with the first ones. <laughs> um, they, they scanned her and I said, please, can you tell me how big it is? Just measure it for yeah. me. And it was gone. Completely disappeared. So I don't know. You need to go back to the previous vets and show them. I that. need to show them, I know. But the frustrating thing is that you're having these arguments with people that, okay, look, they're not allowed to say, go ahead and try cannabis because it's not on their list of things that they're allowed to advise to you. I get that. But they should at least know something about it. Quite. Just Google it. Mm. You have a responsibility to Google it, like I did. Mm. But they don't. They don't even do that. They don't even want to entertain the conversation. And that I find really difficult. 
Yes, that's something drugs. We found that really problematic. It's it's as if people want to deny the fact there is evidence mm -hmm. from other countries. And actually, it was very pleasing last week that the health minister said. We should take into account evidence from other countries of medical cannabis. Of course, we should. I mean, you wouldn't ignore evidence on other, you know, from other countries on any other drug. Why would you assume it was different exactly. in Britain? So at least maybe the debate's beginning to get a bit more open. Why do you think? Earlier, you said you were looking into why they're so anti. Yes. Do you have an opinion on why? I think it's complex. I think it's it's a. Is it's it a, money? No, no. Actually, no. I think I think. Part of the problem is that the initiative Me. is driven by people like you. <laughs> yes. You're not professionals. Silly how, could hippies. You, how could you know yeah. better? Or, you know, I remember my MP yeah, saying to me um, when we first started advocating for cannabis, he said, but the problem is, is you're not a doctor. Right. And I said, no, but I'm a parent and I spend 24-7 with my child. But he said, but you're not a doctor. So that's yeah. the, no one wants to listen to what I've got to say because I'm not a field, doctor. you're more educated <laughs> yes. than the doctor because yeah. the doctor hasn't no, he exactly. hasn't looked because it's not on his list of jobs to do that. I mean, I am a doctor. Okay, go on, pa doc. patient Come on, comes to me us. and says, I found a cure <laughs> for something I've been trying to treat them with for years, right. I, I'd celebrate. Brilliant. I wouldn't say you're wrong. I mean, how could the patient be wrong? I mean, no. that's absurd, isn't it? Right. There's no knowledge. There's no teaching. I mean, when cannabis was banned, we didn't really know what it did. It was kind of you know, magical. You know? But now we know that there are receptors in the brain and we know they're endocannab. You know, there's a huge science, but the medical profession doesn't teach that science. And one of the points I'm making in, the, in this paper I'm putting mm. together is that doctors and vets have a responsibility to keep up to date with modern knowledge. Right. You can't just say, I don't know anything about it, so I won't use it. So go find out. That's and do you know what? I'll have... give you the evening. <laughs> go home. Find out and call me tomorrow yeah. and let yeah. me know what you found out. But they can't. I don't know if their their insurance allows that. Well, it's complicated. But one thing drug science is doing is we are creating teaching packages. We've got a be we've just put together a beautiful set of slides for medical students and pharmacy students, uh. which we're going to roll out at the beginning of next term, so that every student that wants to learn mm. will have access to something that's easy, digestible, and right. Mm. So hopefully we'll move the field forward. Hopefully, I was. You'll probably know the answer to this. What is the punishment for taking cannabis illegally here in this country for um, for medicinal use? Does anybody here know? Do you get years? Oh. Do you get fined? What do you get? <laughs> the rare is it's a class B drug, so you you, know, you, you could, could go, go inside prison for a few years. Five years, up to five years for possession. Yeah. Very few people. But do, I think do, the thing yeah. is as well, it's about how whether you prove that it's medical use or not. The problem is that if you were found with plants in your home, that would be seen as recreational use, even though probably it's medical use. And there is no threshold between personal and use and dealing. If it's dealing, you know, you could, it could be 14 years mm. in prison. Oh, my gosh. And then you have to look at, well, is it worth it? Well, a lot of the time it is. Yeah, well, what you, do you want to do? You've Live decided. You've decided, and you decided. You <laughs> yeah, know, and it was worth it for your dogs, and you took a risk. And, it was I mean, worth it, and it will always be caught. worth it. Yeah, I know. Even though I tell everyone every well, day, I, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, don't tell them where this. you live. <laughs> but it, yeah, it's um, yeah. it's it's kind of a funny little conundrum. A friend of mine, his father was dying of cancer, hmm. and he was very, very much behind giving his dad this yeah. cannabis oil. And we don't know whether it's high in THC or not. We're just trying to help. We're just getting what we can and doing our best. And he's educating himself as I have, which is literally by watching things on online as much as possible and listening to people like yourself. So he had spoken to his dad and his dad was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, because it's illegal. And that's really terrifying. And his family, found it really hard to support that because it's illegal. And I remember speaking to his wife, this is a few days before he died really, and he was really, really suffering, like he couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep, it was, it was the worst. Um, and she was so upset, but she couldn't support it. She just mm -hmm. couldn't, she had tears in her eyes and she just looked at me, she goes, but Joss, it's illegal. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, how? Yeah. How can this mean so much that you don't do that? They give it to him anyway, you know, and then he slept and ate. But, you know, but it was I've sad. experienced it was this. Sad. There are many patient organizations that support patients with different disorders. Mm. And some of them refuse to countenance 
the use of medical cannabis because it's illegal. Ugh. They won't even do research on it because it's illegal. I mean, it's not illegal to research it, but they just say if it's illegal, we don't want to touch they it. Don't want to touch We're it. a charity. We're not going to go somewhere that's illegal. Yeah. Even though it wasn't illegal and it isn't illegal in other countries, but they have this sort of obsession with not breaking the law. That, they put that above everything else, Literally which is ridiculous with the law everything. that's so, so irrational. I think um, as yeah. well, the older generation have this thing about doctors always being right. Yeah. The parents I work with, they all have access to information. They know what drug side effects are. They know what's in the drugs. They know all about cannabis, you know, because they've taught themselves. And actually, I think that's what's making this change happen, where people are starting to take responsibility for their own health and for their children's and that's health. That's what, which that's is what the health service wants. It actually wants patients happen. to take exactly. responsibility, except for cannabis. Yeah. But we, must, we must move on because Susie's <laughs> been sitting here very quietly, worried we're not going to get to her. So you're a scientist, Susie, yes? I am, yes. So I have done quite a lot of research into the links between recreational drug use and mental health in particular. All the research I've done has been on recreational cannabis use which is obviously different and what we have to do is we have to watch what people choose to do and the people who choose to use cannabis recreationally are quite a different population from the people who will choose to use cannabis medicinally so all of the findings that we've got from recreational cannabis how likely those risk factors that cannabis seems to increase the risk of certainly cannabis in adolescence seems to increase the risk of um cognition problems or learning and memory problems likely to not go as far in education all of these kind of things how much that's to do with the biological effects of cannabis and how much that's to do with the people who mm. choose to use cannabis at a particular young age is really really well mm. it's impossible to tease out from using these observational studies where you just follow up groups of people over a period of time see what they choose to do and see the differences that happen between these groups even if you know what all the differences are taking account of them in a model is really difficult because you've got to measure them really accurately and we um, we probably can't do that even if we know what they all are so it's really important to not minimize the potential risks that cannabis might have for some people but the important thing is who are those people and what is it about the cannabis is it something to do with the levels of THC for example that seems to be something that's kind of Yeah, will you tell us a bit more about what's happened about THC in the last 20 years because people don't quite understand how, how things have changed. Yeah, so, I mean, until quite recently, cannabis and THC in the research community were kind of used interchangeably in a way. Almost all of the research, experimental research, was looking at THC because THC is the component in cannabis that gives the kind of high of cannabis. So there was research that showed that if you gave someone THC, they would experience transients or they might experience transient psychotic-like experiences, basically cannabis intoxication. But this would stop after a person was intoxicated. And it's only more recently that CBD has become more kind of widely researched as well. But actually there are hundreds, as you were saying earlier, there are hundreds of different cannabinoids. And that's before we then look at the other things in cannabis as well. And actually, it's a very complicated plant. So with THC, from collecting samples, police seizures and that kind of thing, it looks like the levels of THC in cannabis have really gone up a lot in the last kind of 20 or 30 years. And Potentially, if the THC is the thing in cannabis that's the kind of that increases the risk of lots of these potential negative outcomes for some groups of people, this is really important. But also, alongside that, it looks like levels of CBD have really gone down in lots of the cannabis that's kind of available on the street or that's being used recreationally. Breeding it out. Potentially, or because of just the method of, that it's being grown in, it's not necessarily clear kind of why it's happening. Well, people want to get high, that's why. Well, I mean, that is one reason. Yeah. Well, but it's not just that. It's not just that. Right? It's the, Don't it's they the, make it stronger in THC? And... That's true. But it, I think actually the, the rise in concentration is also just this more bang for your buck. People want to get high. Right. So a stronger, for less. A stronger verse, yeah, for, for less right. product. So it's because the criminalization of the black market means in cannabis in opiates, wherever you look, if you really try to prohibit something, people move to much stronger stronger versions. It was true with alcohol yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. Although, interestingly, in the US, high-potency cannabis products have still are still really popular in states where cannabis is legal as well. So it's it's more it's a complicated picture, but mm. I think that's certainly a part of it. The prohibition makes drives up the strength. Is it non-toxic? Tell us about that. There are no reports of someone dying of overdose of cannabis. Yeah, that's the, the one thing that distinguishes cannabis from pretty much any other drug is it, it's almost impossible to overdose, which makes it, it means even if you accidentally 
eat too many brownies. Which you're is not lovely to know that. And that's reassuring, it? isn't it? That's right. Whereas, yeah. you, I mean, look at the, look, look at last week, you know, 1,200 deaths in Scotland, largely from opiates. And you think, yeah. wow. And there's none from cannabis. And yet they're both in the same schedule. They're both, mm. well, <laughs> schedule one drugs. You know, I mean, it's kind of, it's absurd, really, mm -hmm. to, to treat cannabis as, as dangerous as... What are the negatives? The negatives of cannabis are that some people get paranoid. Actually, sometimes I see that as a bit of a positive because you start, Makes them more careful people. Well, they don't use. <laughs> oh, right. I mean, once people start getting paranoid, they usually start using. I mean, what we don't know, if it was legal, would people get less paranoid? Because mm -hmm. some of the paranoia is because you're going to get caught. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, uh, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that they are out to get you with cannabis. So there's the, there's a the sort of paranoia. That it can bring on, if you've got a vulnerability to schizophrenia, it can bring it on. Right. It won't cause schizophrenia, but it might make you become... Trigger it. Yes, it might trigger it and precipitate it. And then there's dependence. And that's actually the biggest issue, I think, at present. I mean, probably 8% of people who use cannabis regularly get dependent. It's a different kind of dependence to alcohol and opiates because you don't have a, such a clear withdrawal. But it does mean that you are sort of locked into a cycle of use and mm -hmm. continued use, which can, be, can get in the way. And, and eventually people do realise they're dependent and, and seek help. And I think that's another quite important point to make about the evidence that we've got around the harms of cannabis at the moment, is that almost all of the negative effects are really driven by the population of dependent users in any yes, research. Right. Certainly the links with psychosis or psychotic-like experiences, yeah. there are actually very few studies looking at psychosis or schizophrenia itself. It's more kind of lower level. But in all of those studies, you really only see the link in people who are using high potency cannabis every day or the people who've been diagnosed with cannabis dependency those those group of people are really driving it and they might not be the same as people who are using it less frequently who are using less strong cannabis is it right to say that it's mentally addictive rather than physically addictive that's a bit of both it's a little bit of both okay. but the it's the nature of, of the fact that cannabis when you take cannabis it sits in your body for a long time so you don't see this urgent withdrawal that you see from alcohol oh, or like opiates cities, yeah. because it comes out, or nicotine particularly, mm -hmm. it comes because well, the levels fall very fast. Mm -hmm. Cannabis leaches out of the, of the body slowly over a period of weeks. So people don't get a lot of withdrawal. They get a bit of sleep disruption. Mm -hmm. But uh, that doesn't mean they're not dependent. That's the point I'm making. So, I mean, you can get addicted to running. You can get uh, addicted uh, indeed. to... Indeed. That's why I never did it. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> But you're mentioning nicotine. I mean, another problem in terms of people becoming sort of psychologically dependent on right. cannabis is if you're mixing it with the nicotine, smoking it with tobacco, then you've got the added kind of, yeah. you've got this link with the pleasurable experiences of cannabis and then the then you're addicted to the nicotine, nicotine hit that you get. And so you've sort of, yeah. in your head, those kind of news, things become though, linked. The good news is that if, if you're going to smoke nicotine, smoking it with cannabis reduces the harms of the tobacco. Is that right? Yes, there was a very interesting... You're kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you. No, it's because Fantastic. cannabis burns at a lower temperature than tobacco. Really? So you get less toxins from... But from you're still better cannabis. smoking cannabis It's better not smoking any anything tobacco. at all. It's better Unless to, you just not smoke though, right? It's better not to smoke and you can vape it. We've got just a few minutes. I want to get back to Hannah now. Because, so you've obviously been campaigning for children with epilepsy. But you must have worked with many other groups who are interested in cannabis for other disorders and... What's your sort of take on that? I and mean, what's a community of, of people like out there who are trying to move medical cannabis forward? Well, there's a huge amount of groups and people who are trying to influence government and um, make change. Um, you know, pain is the most important thing when it comes to cannabis medicine because there are thousands of people in this country suffering with pain and issues with opioids. But I always feel as well that it's a bit insincere to talk about something when I don't understand it. And what I do understand is being a parent of a severely epileptic child. And that's why I try to be the voice of those parents who don't have a voice in the public domain. Um, but there's a lot of work going on. And I actually think that, you know, End Our Pain have over 120 M supportive MPs. Um, who are signed up to support them within Westminster. I think part of the problem is government thinks we've done, the, we've done our job because all these, yeah. these 80 kids that you're looking after are going to be, OK, they can get the cannabis. We don't need to worry because yeah. you're the ones that people care about. Mm. Yeah, but I in fact, I, it's a much bigger problem. Yeah. I and mean, there are many, many, many groups in many different areas. Absolutely. Where... And I and that's what I think the work is now, which is it, it is difficult because obviously the political climate in the UK 
is filling up the media and we're struggling to get the media to be interested. But what we have to understand is that these families that I work with, for example, are still suffering. They're still having to raise thousands of pounds a month. Yeah, yeah. They might have private prescriptions. Yeah, yeah. The government have to be aware that this is not sorted. You know, there is still a huge amount of work to do and, and changing the law. I mean, the, the, the Home Secretary actually said when the law changed, I am doing this so patients can access medicines that they need to help them to be well, pretty much. That was what he said. That's not happened. And what we saw in the Health Select Committee report, it said, well, we didn't manage expectations. Well, no, you didn't manage expectations. You need to sort that out. You can't just say, oh, sorry, Gov, we actually didn't manage, manage expectations because the floodgates are open. People want access and now they're suffering and now they're having to raise thousands of pounds. So you're absolutely right. The government think that they've done the right thing, but what they've done is slightly open the door and put the fear into the God into most clinicians because they won't prescribe. We're seeing some private prescriptions because they're not bound by these very, very restrictive guidelines in the NHS. But yeah, there's still a huge amount of work to do. And I feel extremely passionate about making access more available to anyone suffering, but especially very severely ill children with epilepsy. So yeah, there's still a lot of work to do. Keep telling your story and keep telling I will, your story. Yeah. I did not know that you could use cannabis in this country for medicinal use like that. No, the, the law was changed on the 1st of November last year. So wow. So that's really specialist that's because doctors. Of you. Well, because of our campaign, yeah, well and done, others, yeah. yeah. No, you we've actually anything. got the best legislation in Europe for medical cannabis. In theory, laughingly, <laughs> laughingly, but no one actually. Uses in theory, it, yeah. yeah. So any no doctor one, can prescribe, but no doctor is allowed for to prescribe. Any symptom, yeah, as long as it's GMP, basically. So they don't. The most of the doctors, they just don't know. That they can well, they it. It. No, they're just having the frighteners put on. So one thing's interesting, Hannah. So you're telling us that the law was changed last November. and Any doctor can now prescribe. Well, any specialist doctor, any specialist can, prescribe doctor can prescribe for any condition. And how many of prescriptions on the NHS? Other than Alfie's and Sophia Gibson in Northern Ireland, who both had licences before the law change, none. <gasps> Zero. Zero. So hang on, how many months is that? That's... Mm. That's almost nine months. Do you think it's because they don't know the doctors that they are not aware? I that think they can it's do this? one. The doctors have had no training, and that's why I've said the law was changed far too quickly. And what they should have done is rolled out some good training first before they did that. Okay. It's also because we have the BPNA and the RCP issuing guidance. So these are professional is, bodies. The BPNA so the BPNA is, is British Paediatric Neurology Association. So if you're a paediatric neurologist, you are a member. They are actually a charity. They're not a professional body. They're not a royal college. Okay, they are just right. a charity mm -hmm. who train their doctors, uh, paediatric neurologists, uh, all around the world, actually. But they are very, seen as a very eminent organisation and the government in the inter because there was no NICE guidance, the government asked the BPNA to issue guidance on uh, prescribing for children with epilepsy and that guidance actually stated that the only drug that should be prescribed is Epidiolex which is actually currently unlicensed and that all full extract GMP prescriptions should not be made because there's no understanding of safety and THC does cause damage to the growing brain. Well actually there's one study about children, uh, teenagers who smoked high strength THC which can cause an exacerbation of mental health disorders. There's a risk and balance to every drug, but when you've got a child with having hundreds of seizures a day, surely mm. it's worth trying a little bit of THC to stop them. So, so that's the first thing. The first thing was they said you can prescribe it. Then the professional body said, well, there's not much evidence because yeah. the trials hadn't been done in the traditional way of double yeah. blind. So huh. they, they dismiss the evidence that her son is alive. Yeah. That's not oh. a real science. But, no. of course it's, but they don't realise. I mean, any, every doctor knows that every time you treat a patient or a dog right. with any medicine, you're doing an experiment. Of course you are. There's no medicine that you can predict will work in any Exactly. Person. So every time it's an experiment. And if it works, you're grateful. Is it, I've even have it, had it suggested to me by very senior paediatric neurologists in the UK that what I've seen is a placebo response. <gasps> Oh, and right. mad mothers like me are so desperate for their children to be well that it's a placebo. But actually, that do you know what? If it was a placebo, brain. who cares? Yeah. That is beyond absurd. Yeah. I really think that's unprofessional. Yeah. Right. One of the things drug science has done, by the way, is we've just written a position paper, which we're hoping the Lancet t will take to the top medical journal, mm. where we've got a medical ethicist arguing that actually it's less ethical to deny someone with proven value mm. a medicine than it is to prescribe a medicine off license Absolutely. because the reality is in Alfie's case there is proof yeah yep so you know what more you know that's better than 
anything you've got. So not to prescribe to someone in, in which medical cannabis has worked, we believe is actually unethical. Yes. And doctors should be really challenged about that. Yeah. But the other thing I want to tell you, that what the government did, so it, then it set up a special route for prescribing. So it said, instead of saying cannabis was a medicine, it said it was a medicine, but it was a special. It is very special. Well, I it's special, but not in a good sense. Special in the sense <laughs> that it's very dangerous. Yeah, and right, okay. if you prescribe a special, you're prescribing outside of your, if you're on the NHS, outside your insurance. And most doctors don't want to do that. And that the makes risk, them fearful. Very fearful. And it also very complicated. A special pad. You've got to have a pink pad to prescribe cannabis. <laughs> so it, it's... Yes, you can have it, you know, but the reality is we're not going to tell you how. Mm -hmm. And so people haven't. And people are very, I Shocking. think doctors are very worried medical legally as well because they have to take complete responsibility. But what they have to remember is every time they prescribe an off-label, unregulated medicine, which they do to children all the time, they are taking personal responsibility for that. So it's no different when they say, oh, but I'm taking personal responsibility. It's no different when you're prescribing a benzo to a six-month-old baby. It's exactly the same. And I think, again, it's this fear, it's this stigma, this is cannabis, this is frightening, and it, that's why education yes. is now so important. It's because they're frightened that the yeah. Daily Mail, will, if one thing goes wrong, the Daily Mail would jump Be on, on them because they're, they're so hysterical about it. There's a lot of hypocrisy here as well because a lot of the medications like benzodiazepines, like ketamine, are also used recreationally yeah. and illicitly. And so it's Absolutely. exactly the same situation. Oh. It's just a drug that kind of hasn't moved that far down these steps it's actually yet. It's safer, yeah. less harmful. <laughs> well, quite, yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's actually Actually, true, it tells you that the anti-cannabis propaganda, which has been running since about 1930, has been very, very effective. Yeah, they've done very well. <laughs> but in other countries, things have got better. And this is the question from our Twitter followers. It's to you, Joss. Oh. And I guess you spent some time in the US, yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you notice about the difference in public opinion about cannabis between the US and the UK? Oh, they love it over there. Yeah. It's very normal <laughs> over there. Very normal. Well... The situation that happened with my dog Dusty, this small poodle, it was in the US. So I had one experience with a vet that was very much like the one I had in the UK, which was, I cannot discuss this with you and you now need to leave. Um, and then another experience with a vet in the city, in Brooklyn, in a place that's I guess more lefty and a little bit, a little bit more open. And she was like, I'm not supposed to discuss this with you, but I think you should go and do it. You know, so it was a different thing. You know, you've got Colorado and yes. you've got California. Um, it's, it's just, they're just more open to it and they use it for all sorts. All sorts of different animal. All sorts of different animal problems and also for fun, but um, many different ailments and they're very open to it and it's not a shock. It's not something that's taboo. So I think we could follow in that. the exact direction. Yeah, actually, why yeah. not? You know. And this actually gets to the question for you, Hannah, from Jodie. Mm. It says, how long did it take for you to get over the stigma of giving cannabis to your child? I never felt stigma. What I feel is terrified of giving my child loads and loads of pharmaceuticals which have no evidence of safety. Mm -hmm. I've never felt fearful about giving him something that is natural under doctor's guidance. And actually, whether this is right or not, I've always felt that I've known what's right for my child. You know, I've lived through everything with him. Mm -hmm. He is my child, you know, as a mother, you know, you know your child inside and out, and I know what's right for him, and I've never, ever felt that cannabis is a problem. Um, I remember speaking to my mum at first when I decided to start using cannabis with Alfie, and I think she probably thought I was a bit mad mm -hmm. <laughs> because she was brought up in, yeah. that, in that era where, you know, you didn't, like you say, it's an illegal drug, but actually I've been very lucky in the sense my friends, family, everyone has always just said, you know, you know what's right for him. And so I've never felt that stigma. I, I'm always more fearful of giving my child benzodiazepines or steroids than than cannabis. Well, I'm sure you've, he's been living a lot longer than he would have done if he mm -hmm. hadn't had you. So uh, now let's move over to Susie. The Brain Fart Podcast. I don't know if that's a Twitter handle or that... <laughs> Referring to us, but put that to one side. The question for Susie is, why is the UK so behind the US on cannabis policy? What is it about British politics culture that keeps this lasting restriction on drug policy? 
We have very erudite listeners, by the way. I mean, it's a really good question. And I'm always really intrigued about how studies, when they're published, are picked up by the media in certain countries and not in others. So in the UK, we had this really strong narrative just before I started doing research in this field. But in the in the like the 90s and the early 2000s, I guess, there was this really strong narrative. Cannabis causes psychosis. And it was in all the newspapers, it was kind of accepted as fact. But in the US, that media pickup of those papers when they were published just didn't happen to the same degree. So when they were talking about legalization of cannabis, there was a bit of talk about the impact of um, cannabis on the developing brain, about how sort of the endocannabinoid system is changing in adolescence and therefore teenagers using cannabis might be a bad idea. But there was really very little about the link between cannabis and mental health. And I find that really interesting that it's exactly the same research being mm-hmm. published in international journals. But mm-hmm. depending on, I guess, where the author is based or the political leanings yeah. of newspapers and that kind of thing. And like to, in terms of sort of why it's happened in the US now and it hasn't happened here, I guess we've been distracted by lots of political nonsense going on in the last few years. And We're talking about the US like it's... Like well, it's one that's country. a really good point, actually. And it's yeah, not. because I mean it is, at, but it's not at the country <laughs> level. Cannabis is still very much illegal in the yeah. US. It's state by state yeah. right. sort of yeah. legislation, but at the federal level, it's still very much illegal. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, they states have their own legislation and they can the make their own laws. Um, the medicinal stores where you get your medicine, they have vaults with piles of money in it because oh, they can't because, use yeah. the bank. That's right. Yes. Because of the federal <laughs> law. So, I mean, how ridiculous is that? But it happens. They get robbed a lot. It's actually quite dangerous to have that much cash. That's why you'll see big security guards stood outside because they will be robbed. So, you know... They're dealing with their own thing. That's no, you're, you're state completely, by state, completely you know. right. That you can cross a state border and go from it being completely legal yep. to it being only legal for medicinal use to it being very, very much not illegal. Risk prison sentence yeah, for yeah, possession. Yeah. So yeah. it's really you need to know exactly. You need to know what the laws and each where the states. borders are. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to know <laughs> where, you, where, where you're standing. Are. That can be challenging. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually think part of the problem is the British media, particularly the newspapers. Oh yeah. I those, think they've attacked. They they attack the drugs. They have, <laughs> you know, recreational drugs, nitrous oxide, cannabis. In a ridiculous way, and I, I don't—I never really understood what it was about their editors, but they see it, they've clearly got real hang-ups about these things. Do you think it's getting better? I think I think the fact we're getting medical cannabis now is making people realise you can't just say cannabis is bad. You have to have yeah. a more nuance. I feel like there are nu- nuances starting. I don't know whether it's yeah. just because I've become more informed, but it does feel to me like, in terms of the media, we are getting we're getting there slowly, slowly. Quite <laughs> more yeah. nuance change. We did lose a senior lose an editor for one of the uh, worst papers recently, which was great. <laughs> Onward. Um, this is a, absolutely a question for you, Joss. Oh, yeah. What is the correct dosage in a suppository for a dog with cancer? There you go. Ah, well, it depends how big ah. your dog is. Yeah, quite. <laughs> and, and also um, in a suppository. Now, that's something interesting. So there was a lady I saw, she, this Australian lady, she had lung cancer. And she had stage four. They told her to go home and die, basically say goodbye to your family. I'm so sorry. This has not worked out with all your chemo. And um, her daughter said, Mum, let's try this. Let's mm-hmm. do this mm-hmm. cannabis thing. And she was like, oh, my God, I can't do that. So this is where I first heard about the suppository. Yeah. So she had never touched cannabis in her life, didn't want anything to do with it. Um, she changed her diet, which is very important. Also for your dog, that's very important just to be healthy basically you have to change your body from acid to alkaline i think mostly that's what they say but that's part of it she decided that she didn't want to be high and it was kind of upsetting her soul a little bit because some people don't enjoy it Mm -hmm. in fact quite a lot of people don't enjoy it Mm -hmm. and she learned that if she used it as a suppository she was good yeah, it didn't yeah. it didn't upset good. her soul yeah, yeah. she just had that before she went to bed she didn't have to deal with that and guess what now she's still alive she no longer has cancer no. she mixed it with uh, coconut oil and put it in the suppository so if you want to know the dosing we are making this up guess what the reason why we're making this up is because there hasn't been enough studies and also we're dealing with different bodies different weights different yeah different people different dogs different cats whatever it is so i went to cureyourowncancer.org okay which is amazing that actually taught me how to make the oil if you happen to be in a country where it is illegal and you can't get it on prescription 
you have to make it yourself. And when you make it yourself, you don't know what's in it. But don't blow yourself up. Don't make it over an open flame because that is dangerous. And and start slow. So even with the dog, even with Dusty, I had three tinctures. Uh -huh. There was um, sativa, indica, hybrid. And then once she got used to those, which I did slowly, 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 because I didn't want to upset her. Yeah. It's horrible to be too stoned. Nobody wants. No, I think it. that's. I think that's good You've advice for, slow, for humans as well as dogs. Yeah. Go yeah. slow. Yeah. And then you do the thick black oil, and then you just cross your fingers and and hope. Now, this one, uh, getting back to you, Hannah. I mean, it, we don't have data on this, but drug science is is trying to think about how we could collect this kind of data. Mm. It's clear that your intervention for your son has saved the health service a lot of money. Yes. A lot of money yes. because every time he was going into intensive care, it was it was costing thousands, thousands. of pounds a night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think about the argument that that medical cannabis would be the, a great saviour of the NHS? I think that's absolutely true. It was actually part of our persuasion of the Home Office that this was a good idea. Is that my mum's actually an accountant before oh. she was retired, and so we we did a very sort of layman's term spreadsheet of of what cannabis was costing and what it would cost in bed days, nurses products, all that sort of stuff in a spreadsheet. And we worked out that with the help of his paediatric um, consultant at our local hospital, we worked out it was costing about £200,000 a year to have Alfie in hospital. And now we pay about £35,000 a year. So it's a massive saving. And if you think that, that could be times by 25,000 children with refractory epilepsy and all the people with pain and bowel problems and all that, I mean, we could save the NHS millions absolutely millions but the, the problem is is I think the NHS and, and as you said this alluded to this before about training of doctors doctors are trained from the beginning how to prescribe pharmaceutical medications pharmaceutical companies are very they're very ingrained within the NHS yeah. and yeah. there definitely is a financial saving but I think it's the complete ethos of how we think about our bodies and health and well-being and yeah. and that we're turning away, away from pharmaceuticals. And actually, people used to think, I think, that they could eat what they like, drink what they like, smoke what they like, and go to the doctor and get a tablet. So, so. And now we're realising that actually we need to take care of our bodies. And I think that's where cannabis comes into that well-being, holistic view of, of health. My friend yeah. that was in the hospital with um, the cancer that I spoke about earlier, his diet when he was in there was like white bread I know. and ham. Awful. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They're trying to cure him of something. Well, like uh, my friend's son had cancer, difficult. and she said on the cancer ward. I mean, she treated her son with cannabis oil, and he because he had to have a bone marrow transplant, which wouldn't take, and then it took. Oh. And she said they did the same thing. They wheeled a trolley of chocolate around every day in the, cannabis, uh, in the cancer ward. And you just think, well, we know glucose actually feeds cancer. It makes no sense whatsoever. No. <laughs> well, unfortunately, yeah. there are a lot of things like that in the NHS <laughs> and in politics. Yeah. But we do love the NHS. We do. We do. Yeah, yes, let's not give up on it. <laughs> no, let's never, <laughs> ever, ever. Drug give science up on. is going to. Uh, so well, we have already produced, which we'll release in October when the new term starts, we've produced a, a teaching module, beautiful set of slides for undergraduate doctors, nurses, pharmacists. So no one will ever need to say again, they don't know what go. medical cannabis is and how it works and what the endocannabinoids is. So Perfect. we're going to put the education into it. Very Britain. good. Yeah. Thank God. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Let me just, there, there's one important issue which we haven't touched on really is this, I think you did a little bit, Susie, this ratio of THC to CBD, but you were talking about that in the context of the street use, mm. but we need to talk about it a little bit in terms of the medical use, because we know that some conditions do better on high CBD and low THC and others mm. do better on high THC and low CBD and some on, some on a bit of both. And um, do either of you want to comment on how you decided that for your dog or your child? I just went straight high THC. You went straight high? Yeah, only because um, of what I'd cancer. learned online, yeah. the, the cancer yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, with Alfie, um, we started on a full extract CBD which has some THC yeah. in and then we just added in a little bit of THC. I mean, it's it's not rocket science in that sense. You start low, you go slow, mm -hmm. you always start with CBD, get to a, high, a good dose of high CBD and then maybe add in a bit of extra THC with epilepsy. And this is one thing that I get very frustrated about is the obsession in the media and with clinicians of THC. Actually, when you're talking about treating a child with epilepsy, it's a tiny, tiny part. Full extract CBD, good quality CBD is the treatment. And we know from the WHO that CBD is non-toxic, non-addictive. Mm -hmm, 
absolutely safe to use. Mm, mm. But obviously with pain and stuff, you're having to look at THC and things like that. But it, I, I think the rule of thumb is to start low, go slow, see how you feel. It's difficult with children with epilepsy, usually very severe epilepsy, their non-verbal cognition is a problem. But I think with adults with pain, you can go on how you feel. But the most important thing is to not change your dose more than once a week really it took five weeks to show any to. results in alfie at all mm -hmm. and i think people panic when you're using cannabis you've got to be very calm and you have to you know change doses or change whatever you're doing once a week so you can really see whether there's a benefit or or not and you really, really need a regulated product to be able to do Absolutely. that as well, because yeah. there's been lots of studies looking at the CBD that you can buy on the high street. And the amount that they say is in it is often, very often, completely, completely wrong, either way higher or way lower yeah. or none at all with THC where there's not meant to be or where there isn't where there is and, meant to and, be. And, and that's the point as well with the government changing the law and clinicians not prescribing. What, what are families going to do? They're going to go to unregulated sources and use, or they're going to make it. Totally. They're going to go to the man down the road who says, I've got plants. I mean, I have yeah. that all the time. Families contact me and say, oh, I've been offered oil from some guy who makes it around the corner. Yeah. And well, what's in it? How do you know? And, and we've seen some p adults who've been given oil. And I know a guy was telling me the other day they tested it and they had morphine in it. You yeah. know, because they're putting oh, opioids in cannabis yeah. oil. If we don't allow people to access medical cannabis for their problems, they will they access will it their anyway. Own. They'll go to private problem, or they go abroad and criminalise themselves, or they'll go to dealers and mm -hmm. and or and they'll try it sources. out. And potentially, it won't work. Not because it won't work, exactly. But because and it's they'll a say, "Well, tiny cannabis dose. doesn't work yeah. for my child," and it's not that. It's because they probably need six bottles for actually exactly. to get any good dose of CBD. Mm. Well, the good news is that I am sure that this podcast <laughs> will make. The Department of Health think much more sensibly about what it's doing. I hope so. And we're going to, Drug Science is going to continue to lobby, pursue, and facilitate the development of medical cannabis. So yeah. follow us, follow us on Twitter. We've got this very exciting new project called 2021 coming out where we're hoping to get 20,000 people who would benefit from medical cannabis, cannabis into treatment by 2021, working with the patient cool. alliances. So f watch this space. Thank you for listening. And I'm just going to, before I finish, I just need to op give this opportunity to each of the speakers to say one last word. So, Hannah? Pretty much reiterating what you're saying, um, I will not rest until I feel that people who are very vulnerable have help in this country. We are a modern growing country i mean we are a country the seventh richest country in the world we should be making products available to patients who need it i feel very sad that that's not happening and so you know my work is very much advocating for people who have no voice um i feel very very strongly about that and i think if we all do that then there will be change the government has to listen eventually and the clinicians will have to listen and we need to ask them to change their thinking about what is evidence and I think that's really Absolutely. really important. Joss what would you say what would your last uh, well, words be? I have to say this has made my day to sit here with all of you guys it is so inspiring and encouraging about oh 10 years ago I was sat in LA at a talk about justice and it was at the beginning of all this madness and that yes there was a room full of hippies half of them half of them were hippies and the others were scientists and i remember coming home to england and talking about it and the conversation was not it just wasn't okay do not discuss this and now here we are not only are we discussing it but we're going to show everyone mm. and nobody's scared no one around this table is scared everyone is good and it's super positive i think it's lovely i've seen the work that cannabis can do and i think it's it's very encouraging very inspiring so i can't wait to see what's next Susan. It's really great that this conversation is moving beyond fear of an illegal substance, fear of an illicit drug, to actually acknowledging that drugs, as we think about them, are complex and can have positives and negatives. They can have risks, but they can also have potential benefits. And this kind of fear from a lack of education or misinformation being spread is beginning to be countered slowly. Um, maybe le less slowly, maybe things are getting better all the time. And I think that's really exciting. And I think it's great that there's for quite different people all sitting around this table, all coming from very different places, but going in the same direction. And, and I think that's really, really positive. Well, that's a great note on which to end. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast and uh, listen out for the next one, which will be on addiction. Thank you very much.
Let's talk quickly about our live show on psychedelics, which is taking place on the 13th of November. The event will be held in central London. Space is limited and tickets are going quickly. So please go to the drugscience.org.uk website to make sure you get a space. And thank you also to today's guests, Hannah Deakin, Joss Stone and Susie Gage. Check out the show notes for details of how to follow them. And for more information on drug science, follow us on Twitter at Drug Science or go to our website, drugscience.org.uk. That's everything from a us today. Join us next for time science. for a fascinating chat about addiction. And if you like this episode, please click the subscribe button and leave us a review. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.